Chapter 3. Effect of the President's Communication It is impossible to describe the effect produced by the last words of the Honorable President. The cries, the shouts, the succession of roars, hurrahs, and all the varied vociferations which the American language is capable of supplying. It was a scene of indescribable confusion and uproar. They shouted, they clapped, they stamped on the floor of the hall. All the weapons in the museum, discharged at once, could not have more violently set in motion the waves of sound. One need not be surprised at this. There are some cannoneers nearly as noisy as their own guns. Barbicane remained calm in the midst of this enthusiastic clamor. Perhaps he was desirous of addressing a few more words to his colleagues, for by his gestures he demanded silence, and his powerful alarm was worn out by its violent reports. No attention, however, was paid to his request. He was presently torn from his seat and passed from the hands of his faithful colleagues into the arms of a no less excited crowd. Nothing can astound an American. It has often been asserted that the word impossible is not a French one. People have evidently been deceived by the dictionary. In America, all is easy, all is simple. And as for mechanical difficulties, they are overcome before they arise. Between Barbicane's proposition and its realization, no true Yankee would have allowed even the semblance of a difficulty to be possible. A thing with them is no sooner said than done. The triumphal progress of the President continued throughout the evening. It was a regular torchlight procession. Irish, Germans, Scotch, all the heterogeneous units which make up the population of Maryland shouted in their respective vernaculars, and the vivas, hurrahs, and bravos were intermingled in inexpressible enthusiasm. Just at this crisis, as though she comprehended all this agitation regarding herself, the moon shone forth with serene splendor, eclipsing by her intense illumination all the surrounding lights. The Yankees all turned their gaze toward her resplendent orb, kissed their hands, called her by all kinds of endearing names. Between eight o'clock and midnight, one optician in Jones Fall Street made his fortune by the sale of opera glasses. Midnight arrived, and the enthusiasm showed no signs of diminution. It spread equally among all classes of citizens, men of science, shopkeepers, merchants, porters, chairmen, as well as greenhorns, were stirred in their innermost fibers. A national enterprise was at stake. The whole city, high and low, the quays bordering the Parazzo, the ships lying in the basins, disgorged a crowd drunk with joy, gin, and whiskey. Everyone chattered, argued, discussed, disputed, applauded, from the gentleman lounging upon the barroom set with his tumbler of sherry cobbler before him, down to the waterman who got drunk upon his knock-me-down in the dingy taverns of Fell Point. About 2 a.m., however, the excitement began to subside. President Barbicane reached his house, bruised, crushed, and squeezed, almost to a mummy. Hercules could not have resisted a similar outbreak of enthusiasm. The crowd gradually deserted the squares and streets. The four railways from Philadelphia and Washington, Harrisburg and Wheeling, which converge at Baltimore, whirled away the heterogeneous population to the four corners of the United States, and the city subsided into comparative tranquility. On the following day, thanks to the telegraph wires, 500 newspapers and journals, daily, weekly, monthly, or bimonthly, all took up the question. They examined it under all its different aspects, physical, meteorological, economical, or moral, upon its bearings on politics or civilization. They debated whether the moon was a finished world, or whether it was destined to undergo any further transformation. Did it resemble the earth at the period when the latter was destitute as yet of an atmosphere? What kind of spectacle would its hidden hemisphere present to our terrestrial spheroid? Granting that the question present was simply that of sending a projectile up to the moon, everyone must see that that involved the commencement of a series of experiments. All must hope that some day America would penetrate the deepest secrets of the mysterious orb, and some even seemed to fear lest its conquest should not sensibly derange the equilibrium of Europe. The project, once under discussion, not a single paragraph suggested a doubt of its realization. 
all the papers, pamphlets, reports, all the journals published by the scientific, literary, and religious societies enlarged upon its advantages, and the Society of Natural History of Boston, the Society of Science and Art of Albany, the Geographical and Statistical Society of New York, the Philosophical Society of Philadelphia, and the Smithsonian of Washington sent innumerable letters of congratulation to the Gun Club, together with offers of immediate assistance and money. From that day forward, Impey Barbicane became one of the greatest citizens of the United States, a kind of Washington of science. A single trait of feeling, taken from many others, will serve to show the point which this homage of a whole people to a single individual attained. Some few days after this memorable meeting of the gun club, the manager of an English company announced, at the Baltimore Theatre, the production of Much Do About Nothing. But the populace, seeing in that title an allusion damaging to Barbicane's project, broke into the auditorium, smashed the benches, and compelled the unlucky director to alter his playbill. Being a sensible man, he bowed to the public will, and replaced the offending comedy by As You Like It, and for many weeks he realized fabulous profits. End of chapter 3